given them an opportunity to be with colleagues, share their work, be inspired, re-energize, strategize, and plan for the next project. So for that, we are truly grateful. Thank you so much. All photographers have stories that describe the journey they took to get to where they are today. Many have experienced a road to Damascus, an enlightening moment of clarity that shows them the way forward. Some, due to the often very high-risk nature of the profession, have experienced trauma that has dealt them a life-changing and debilitating injury. Then there is Giles Dooley. The story you're about to hear is both terrifying and inspirational. Prepare to be amazed and inspired. Giles is a true beacon of strength, resilience, and hope. Please welcome Giles Dooley. Um, before I start, I just want to explain that in my talk, about halfway through, there is some quite graphic video um, taken soon after I was injured. Um, some people may want to turn away when that comes on. My story begins when I was 18 years old. I'd gone to America on a sports scholarship. I was the world's worst boxer, but I thought I was great. Um, I remember my coach gave me a backhanded compliment. He said, Giles, you take a punch really well. But sport was my life. I'd given everything to it. And unfortunately, after a few months of moving to America, I was involved in a minor car accident, and I was told I would never do sport again. I was flown back to London, and there in hospital, I became a very angry young man. Everything I dreamt of doing had been taken away from me. The idea that I could never do sport again. I had no idea what to do next. I had no place at university. I wasn't very academic. It seemed like I had no future. As I say, I was a very angry young man, angry with the doctors, my family, everybody around me. And then, in that very low moment, two small gifts were to change my life forever. My godfather, unfortunately, he passed away when I was in hospital, and he left me an Olympus OM-10 camera and a book by the war photographer Don McCullen. I grew up in a house where I'd never really seen um, arts or news. My parents weren't interested in these things. And seeing Don McCullen's black and white stark images of the Vietnam War, famines in Bangladesh, Biafra, was the first time I was exposed to this kind of photography. I knew there and then that's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to follow in the footsteps of Don McCullen and become a war photographer. So I taught myself photography lying in a hospital bed. I photographed the doctors, the nurses, my fruit bowl, anything. I learned the basics, and I left hospital full of good intentions to follow in Don McCullen's footsteps. But I was 18 years old, and at 18, as we know, it's very easy to get distracted. I had a few friends that were musicians, that were in bands, and they asked me if I would go along and photograph their gigs and take album covers. And before I knew it, magazines were calling me. And really by accident, um, I became a rock and roll photographer. It was the mid-90s in the UK, um, and my career took off very, very quickly. Before I knew it, I was flying around the world, working with the likes of Oasis, Mariah Carey, Marin Manson, Lenny Kravitz. I was really living the dream. If you can imagine hanging out with your favorite musicians, actors, fashion models, getting paid a lot of money to do it. And I was only a teenager. It really seemed like the perfect life. And for 10 years, this is what I did. 
But as the years went on, I found myself increasingly unhappy, and I couldn't figure out why. On the surface, as I say, it seemed like I had this amazing life. But inside, I felt empty. I also didn't like the way my industry was going. I didn't like celebrity culture. And I didn't like the way that women were portrayed in a lot of the magazines that I was working for. Finally, it all came to a big climax when I was 28 years old. I was doing a photo shoot in the Charlotte Street Hotel in London, Soho. And there was an argument going on between a young actress, her agent, and the editor of a magazine. And they were arguing about whether she should be undressed or not, and she was in tears. And I sat there watching this, and it was a eureka moment when I said, this is not why I became a photographer. I want nothing to do with this world. So the story, um, bearing in mind that I was hanging out with a lot of bands at the time, the story was a rock and roll story. Um, it was said that I picked up all my cameras, I was really angry, and I threw them out the hotel window like the Rolling Stones. But anyone who knows me knows I'm actually not that rock and roll. Um, I had a little hissy fit, and I threw them on the bed. It was unfortunately a very bouncy bed, and the cameras flew out the window. But it was, I thought, the end of my photographic career. Um, I moved away from London. I moved to a small fishing village called Hastings, and I got a job in a bar there. And I sunk further and further into a depression. Over the next two years, I sunk really to the lowest point you could imagine. I was suffering from many addictions. I really had lost sight of any future. I remember one day sitting by the sea, and I could not see any reason in carrying on with my life. I really thought that was it, the end. And then at that lowest moment, I remembered those two small gifts. I remembered the book by Don McCullen and that Olympus OM-10 camera, and how those two gifts had made me feel 10 years before. And that's when I realized I hadn't been following my true path, that I had got distracted by fashion, celebrity, money, and that if I was gonna find happiness, I would have to return to that original path and follow in the footsteps of Don McCullen. So I sold my flat and I moved to Angola and I started to work documenting the impact of conflict. I'm not a war photographer. I set out to be an anti-war photographer. You will never see a picture of a gun, a tank, a plane in any of my images. My work is solely about the impact of civilians in conflicts around the world. During the First World War, over 90% of the casualties in war were soldiers. In most modern conflicts, it's the other way around. And most casualties are civilians, up to 90%. And it's those stories that I wanted to tell. So as I say, I worked in places like Angola, um, Congo, Bangladesh, South Sudan, telling stories of individuals caught up in war. But sometimes I questioned if I was doing the right thing. This is a young boy in a hospital in South Sudan. I say a hospital. It was a collection of mud huts being run by Medicine Sans Frontieres. This boy was in one of these huts. There was only one doctor there, Dr. Murray, and he was rushing around checking everybody. This boy had been shot in the stomach and the arm. Dr. Murray ran in. He looked at him, shook his head, and ran off to deal with another case, another life he might be able to save. And I had to make the decision, do I take this photograph? Now I can sit here and I can tell you I did it for all the right reasons. It's important we know about child soldiers. It's important you know about the war in South Sudan. I had to take the photograph. But as a human being, it goes against every instinct you have to point your camera at a dying boy. I took a couple of frames, and then I put my camera down, and I sat with him for the rest of the day. That evening, I went up to Dr. Murray, and I said, I don't think I can ever take another photograph again. I said, I felt like a vulture today. I felt physically sick taking that photograph. Now, Dr. Murray, he's from Australia, 
And he looked at me and he said, Giles, you're wrong. And he went on to explain that as an Australian growing up in a remote part of the outback, he was inspired by looking at Sunday magazines and copies of National Geographic. And he said, seeing photographs like yours had inspired him to become a doctor. And he said it was photographs like yours that had inspired him to go and work in places like South Sudan. Now, I can't say I immediately felt perfect. And to this day, sometimes I still feel very uncomfortable taking the photographs I do. But his words did reinforce a belief that I have. And that is each one of us has the power to create change. Each one of us has a skill, an ability, a talent that we can use to make a difference in the world. I discovered mine was storytelling. Some people can work in other ways, but each one of us should use that skill to create change. It was while uh, doing this work that I ended up in Afghanistan in 2011. Again, I was documenting the impact of war on civilians. I was with a group of American soldiers one morning exactly 10 years ago this week when we were ambushed. As we ran for cover, I stepped on an IED, an improvised explosive device, a landmine. I was thrown in the air. I didn't lose my consciousness. I remember landing. I was under some trees. I could see my legs were in the trees. There was a bird singing. It was a blue sky. What you're about to see is the footage taken in the moments after. that it was going to be a triple amputee. A triple amputee is not necessarily uncommon, but it definitely ups the oh no factor. Not many of those make it. The casualty Phil and CJ were picking up was Giles. He'd been photographing an American unit on the dawn patrol when he stood on a Taliban IED. I have a memory of just floating. With no sound, nothing, but this, this intense heat. And then a sudden impact and just landing on my side. You can see my legs had gone. I just thought that was it. You know, I've seen people with far less injuries succumbing to their injuries very quickly. I remember just thinking in my mind at that point, I'm not dying in Afghanistan. The biggest thing was loss of blood. We needed to make sure that his body wasn't going to go too far into shock. We had to uh, go with an interosseal device, which is, um, in layman's terms, it's a ballpoint pen that goes into your sternum so you can push fluids through into the bone marrow. He just kind of like gritted down and took the first one. Uh, like a champ, really. But as soon as they started to flush, that's when the major pain, that's when he really, like, he opened up his eyes, he heard him yell. And you just think, I can keep alive for 10 minutes, I can keep alive for five minutes. And that's really all I'm thinking about. Giles was being taken to the hospital at the U.S. military base in Kandahar. What's your name? Giles. Okay. Good. Tell the fighter to go dead. Uh, said you're a fighter, buddy. I'm gonna live. Fuck yeah, you're gonna live. Hell yeah. Oh, uh, thank you, guys. Come on, buddy. We're your people. He 
just used up everything that my body had to keep focused till Kandahar. I think at that point my brain just, just switched off. I was flown back to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham in the UK. My family was told there was virtually no chance of my survival. I spent the next 46 days in what I call the ultimate lockdown. I was strapped to the bed. My one remaining hand was in a cast so I could not move it. I had tubes in my neck and my throat. The only way I could communicate with the world was by blinking. In intensive care units, the lights never go off. You have no idea of time. You cannot even see out of the windows. On two occasions, my family was called in to say their final goodbyes, and the only way I could respond was by blinking. I knew that I was going to have to find a way with inside my own imagination to survive. At first, I was in a panic. It was like being thrown in the frozen cold water. I couldn't think straight. So I decided I had to create a world inside my mind. So I created projects. Now, as I say, I had no idea of time, but I knew the nurses came at regular intervals. So that was the unit of time in my world. And I created a project called 100 Portraits Before I Die. I imagined the 100 people I wished I'd taken portraits of in my life. Some were living, some were dead, some were famous. And I imagined, in fact, more than imagined, I visualized each one of these portrait sessions. I would see in my mind the person turning up, the conversation we would have, the camera that we would use, how those photographs would look at the end of each one of those sessions. I even found myself criticizing those photographs and seeing what I could do better the next time. And you know what is truly remarkable? In those 46 days where I could not communicate with the world, where everything was going on just in my mind, I became a better photographer. If I look at the cameras and the technique that I used before I was injured and the way I work now, everything changed in just those 46 days. So I know many people right now are dealing with restrictions and lockdowns, but if your imagination is still free, then trust me, you can still grow, you can still expand, and you can still become a better person. Anyway, after 46 days, I was moved to what's called a high dependency unit. I was now conscious fully, I could speak. And actually, this is when things got really difficult for me. Because this is when I had to come to terms with my new reality. I was told I would never walk again, that I would never work again. In fact, I'd probably never even live independently again. Everything I valued in my life had been taken away from me. I remember three months after I was injured, I was well enough for the first time to be transferred into a wheelchair and taken to have a shower. It was the first time I saw myself in a mirror. And I was repulsed. I was disgusted by seeing myself, my missing limbs, the scars across my body. When they put me back into my bed, I cried myself to sleep. And I remember thinking, I wished I'd just died on that helicopter. I was not brave enough or strong enough to deal with this new reality. I did not want to be this person. But the next morning, something had changed. Um, I'm notoriously stubborn. And the next morning, my stubbornness had come back with a vengeance. And I remember I woke up the next day, and I said it did not matter what had happened to me. Somehow, I was going to turn this into something positive. And from this moment on, I would never think about the things I couldn't do. I would just think about what I could and excel at those things. And the first thing I needed to deal with was how I saw myself. As I say, I found it disgusting to see my injuries. If friends came to visit, I would cover myself up with a sheet. And I decided the only way to deal with this is the same way that I'd been helping others to tell their stories. I would have to use photography. So my friend came. Um, he literally broke me out of hospital. We were pulling all these different tubes out. Um, and we went to his photographic studio. And I did a self-portrait. Just before I went to Afghanistan, I'd been in the British Museum. And in the British Museum, 
they have one of the greatest collections of Roman and Greek statues. I remember walking around that exhibit literally days before Afghanistan and how beautiful those statues were. And I remembered that most of those statues were missing parts, but I had only ever seen the beauty that was still remaining. And I decided that's how I wanted to photograph myself. So I did this self-portrait. This was the moment I took control of my own life. I said to people, it does not matter what you think of when you look at me. What matters is what I think of when I see myself. And I knew when I did this photograph that while many people may see what was missing, I knew I was now a more focused man. I was now a stronger man. And in fact, when I took this portrait, I knew I was now a better man. I went back to hospital. I had 37 operations that year. Um, but at the end of 12 months, I was able to leave. I began my rehabilitation. Um, they taught me eventually how to walk. They also taught me to make strange grimacing faces. And 18 months to the day after I was injured, I was back in Afghanistan working as a photographer, doing the work that I am proud to do every day. Now, anybody that knows me, though, knows I don't like to talk about myself too much, and I'd rather tell the stories of others. So I want to finish my talk by telling somebody else's story. In 2014, three years after I was injured, I was well enough to return to work full time. And by that, I mean carrying all my own gear, traveling on my own. And the place I decided to go was to Lebanon. I wanted to document some of Syria's most vulnerable refugees, the elderly, single parent families, and those living with war injuries, such as myself. People like Khulud. Khulud had been at home in Syria. She was tending to vegetables in her garden. Her children were with her when a sniper shot her in the neck. She actually fell on top of one of her own children. She was now paralyzed from the neck down. Her family managed to get her out and get her emergency medical treatment, and then they escaped into Lebanon. When I met her and her husband, Jamal, and their children, they were living in this makeshift tent. It was made of cardboard, bits of plastic, and even billboard posters ripped down. If you imagine a woman paralyzed from the neck down, living in a homemade tent, her only carer, Jamal. They had been completely abandoned by the world, and yet they were full of strength and laughter. I remember saying to Khulud, what's your one hope for the future? And she said, Giles, I just want to be a mother again. On this trip, um, I also met Reem. Uh, Reem had been in Syria when a rocket hit her house. Her husband was killed in the bed next to her. She lost her leg. One of her children died that night as well. When I met her in Lebanon, in the Bekar Valley, she was living on the top floor of this unfinished building. Because of her prosthetic leg, she didn't even know how to get up and down the stairs. She was quite literally trapped on that rooftop. The only person that lived with her was her father, Hamed. Now, if you go online or you see my pictures in the exhibition, um, you will see I often use this white background. It's a bed sheet, the most well-traveled bed sheet in the world. Um, and I like to put it up and do these portraits of people looking straight at me. And so we were on this rooftop, I'd set up my white sheet, and every time I was about to take Ahmed's photograph, he would look to the side. I'd be like, no, 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 look at me, I'm going to take his photograph, and he would look to the side. So eventually I had to say to him, I'm sorry, but why do you keep looking this way? And he said, Giles, he said, do you see the mountains in the distance? I said, yes. He said, that is Syria. He goes, I'm an old man. I will probably never return there. So I live on this rooftop, so the first thing I see in the morning and the last thing I see at night is my homeland. And so he is the only person I've ever photographed not looking at my camera. Because in this photograph, he is looking to home. Now on this trip, I also met a young girl called Aya. I don't like to portray people as victims. It's comes of circumstance but I don't like to betray victims in my images. But with Aya, I was really struggling. Um, she was four years old at the time. She was living in a tent that was very muddy and wet. She was really in a desperate situation. 
and Aya has spina bifida, meaning she's paralyzed from the waist down. So she was struggling to even sit up. And I thought, if I take her photograph, it will look horrible, it would be like a victim. So I said, you know what? I'm not gonna take any photographs. And I asked the family if I could just spend the day visiting. Well, it turned out, and this is not for the first time in my life, Aya was completely and utterly wrong. Aya was not a victim. Aya was the feistiest four-year-old I've met in my life. I soon worked out that she pretty much ran the family and the refugee camp. Her sister walked in, Aman. Aya looked at her and she said, hey, donkey, pick me up. So Aya was picked up and then we started walking around the camp. There would be somebody selling bread. Aya would look at them and say, hey, donkey, give me the bread. They would. We'd go somewhere else and she'd say, hey, donkey, give me the water. They would. And as I say, I discovered Aya ran this whole refugee camp. So eventually, I did take a photograph. And this is of her playing hopscotch with her sister. Like I say, I don't want to show victims. Because when I travel to the places I go to, what I find is laughter, people sharing meals, jokes. I find feisty characters like Aya. And I want to reflect that reality that I find. Anyway, I did this trip. Um, it was a very important trip for me. It was the first time that I had fully worked um, since my injuries. In fact, one of the interesting things is that before I went to do this story, none of the magazines that I'd worked with in the past had called me up. All the people that I used to work for had abandoned me after I got injured. None of them had believed that as a triple amputee, I could work again. And I remember saying to Claude, Aya's mother, and many other families, I remember saying to them, you are the ones that have trusted me to tell your story. And I always said, you are the ones that gave me my life back. So I came back, the pictures were published, um, and my career really took off again. Um, two years later, I was working full time and I got a phone call from the UNHCR, the United Nations Refugee Agency. And they said, Giles, we'd like to commission you to document the refugee crisis across the Middle East and Europe for one year. This was the biggest project I had ever had. But I got probably the greatest assignment ever given to a photographer. As many people in this room will know, with these big projects, you tend to get pages and pages of notes and requirements and terms and conditions. But for this project, they sent me an email with just one sentence. It said, Giles, follow your heart. And that was my job for a year. So I documented um, scenes that sadly we're all too familiar with in places such as Lesbos. I traveled across Europe, up the Balkans. I was in Iraq, I was in Jordan. But I knew if I was going to fulfill my brief and follow my heart, I would have to go back to Lebanon and find some of those families that I'd met two years before, the families that had given me my life back. So in 2016, I went back and I tracked some of these families down. Now, I think it's really nice and important to take photographic prints back with you to give to the people you've documented. But let me tell you, for a guy with no legs and one arm, taking photographic prints halfway around the world is a real pain. And I get there and I give Ahmed his photograph and he looked at it and he looked at me and he just said, Giles, you made me look really old in this. I thought, well, there's gratitude for you. But life uh, for Reem and her father had returned to some kind of normalcy. She now had other members of the family. She'd learned how to use her prosthetic legs. She could get up and down the stairs. Life had returned to some kind of normal. But of course, for refugee families, their life really is stuck in limbo. This is Reem with her daughter, Sarah. And as you would with many kids, I said to her, tell me about your favorite subject at school. Tell me about your friends. And Sarah just looked at me and she said, I have no friends. I have no school. I live alone on this rooftop. And that is the reality for most of these families. Now, for over 10 years, they've been living like this in Lebanon. Of course, I had to go and find Aya um, and her family. They had moved. They were now living in these unfinished buildings in the north of Lebanon. Aya, though, was as feisty as ever. Uh, this is her being pushed by her brother. She was screaming, faster, donkey, faster. But again, like Reem's family, they're stuck in limbo. Uh, the children are not legally allowed to go to school. If Aya is sick, they can't take her to the hospital. 
and the parents are unable to work. Now I said I managed to find most of these families that I'd met two years before, but obviously some had moved, some had changed their phone numbers, some had even returned to Syria. On the last day I got a phone call. It was from Jamal, Khalud's husband. He said, Giles, we hear you're back in Lebanon. We would love to see you. And I will never forget what happened in the conversation next. I said to him, of course, where are you now? And he said, we are in the same place. I repeated my question. I said, no, where are you living now? And he said, we are in that same tent. I had never met anyone in more desperate situation than I had when I met Khalud two years before. I had photographed her story. Those photographs had been used by charities. Those photographs had been published around the world. I so naively thought there was no way they could be living in the same circumstance. I had not even bothered to look for them there. The next day, I went to their camp and I walked into this tent, this homemade tent, and I looked at Khalud and I burst into tears. And I said, two years ago, I came here and you gave me my life back. But I have failed you. I have let you down. But I said, there's only one thing I know how to do, and that is to tell stories. So please trust me to tell your story again. And that's what I did. Over the next uh, week, I spent all my time there documenting day-to-day -day life. Um, Jamal, when we go into the kitchen, he will whisper to me his greatest fear. He will say, I don't think Khulud loves me as much as I love her. It's a place full of love and laughter. But if you imagine, for two years since I last saw her, she had not left this bed. There are no windows. In the summer, it is like an oven. In the winter, it is like a freezer. And yet she smiles all the time. The family is always laughing. You leave that tent feeling uplifted. On the last day I was there, I had a really difficult decision. As I showed you earlier, I like to take photographs back with me. I like to share the images I've done. And in my bag, I had the photograph that I had done of Khulud and Jamal two years before. But I thought, if I give them this photograph, won't it remind them that nothing has changed? Won't it remind them their story is stuck in this limbo? But I thought, no, I must give them this photograph. So I reached into my bag, and I took this photograph that I had taken two years before, and I handed it to them. But when I did, I looked at Khulud, and I said, when I took this photograph, I did not take a photograph of a refugee. I did not take a photograph of a disabled woman. When I took this photograph, I was taking a photograph of a couple who are so in love with each other. And this is a photograph of love. And that's when I realized I am not a war photographer. I document love. I go to the worst places imaginable. I see crimes, I see injuries, I see things that I cannot even speak of. But what do I find there? I find humanity. I find a grandmother with her grandchild, a mother feeding her baby, a father on the floor doing lessons with his children. I find couples like Khulud and Jamal holding hands, their love unbreakable. And it is that that I choose to photograph. I have been so inspired these last few days by all these amazing photographers, all of us telling these important stories. We have a gift, a chance to tell stories, but it is something far beyond a business and industry. I know from speaking to many of you, looking at your work and hearing your words, how each one of you feels the same as I do that what we do is share stories. When I was injured and I was flown back to the UK and my family was told I was not going to survive, they were wheeling me into the theater to operate on me. And my sister was there. And she could see that I was trying to say something. 
And she said, he's trying to say something, please, can we hear? And they said, no, he's unconscious, he's not speaking. And my sister was like, well, you don't know my brother, trust me, he's trying to say something. So they stopped, and they took the oxygen mask off. I don't remember any of this. In my mind, I was unconscious. My poor sister thought I was going to say, I love you, I'm sorry, goodbye. But no, the only words that came out were, I am still a photographer. And that is the reality for us all. For each one of us, that is the truth. Photography is our lifeblood. Thank you. His Excellency on stage. I have a small gift. Um, I talked about this photograph um, on the first day. Uh, this photograph is of a woman called Deborah. Uh, Deborah is a survivor herself. She lives in South Sudan, has suffered uh, many, many torments. When I met her, she held my hand and she looked at me and she said to me, stop worrying about your life. She said, stop thinking about all the things you have lost. She said, you still have your eyes, you can see us. She said, you still have your ears, you can hear our words. You have your hand, you can still write, you can still take photographs. She said, why are you worrying so much? And I was so inspired by Deborah, and I came back and I was flying to Japan straight after this. And in Japan, I went to a museum and there was a broken vase, a beautiful heirloom that had been passed down through families, but it had been broken one time. And I noticed that the cracks had been mended with gold. And I asked, what is this? And they said, this is Kintsugi. We celebrate the cracks as part of the story. And I realized it's the same for all of us. I have scars, physical and psychological. Deborah has scars. Many of us in this room have our own battles that we have fought. Too often we hide them. Too often we are ashamed of them. In this picture, we pulled it apart and we reconstructed it to represent Deborah's resilience. And this is a tribute to individuals all around the world that have suffered from war, that have been held together. And I hope all of them one day can celebrate their stories through gold. A present. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And thank you for having me here as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.